Thank you so much. Weren't those wonderful words? And it's such a pleasure to be here again in Bhutan. I was here last March for the first time. Uh, after reading and knowing so much about your country from afar and then beginning to sample it up close, and my admiration has been growing in leaps and bounds. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight to share with you some of the most important trends that I think are going on in the world with regard to governance and leadership, and it has to do with collaboration. And here's an overview of what I'd like to talk about. First of all, I'd like to talk with you about buzzwords and how collaboration has become a buzzword. And yet, it's also crucial for taking on Bhutan's and the world's most important problems. I'll share with you some exciting new developments in this area, and then some examples which I think might be useful for focusing the challenges facing leaders and managers as they think about collaboration. And finally, I'd like to suggest some topics with applications to Bhutan to stimulate your discussion, questions, and contributions. So let's move ahead then. First of all, buzzwords. Here's a man giving some propaganda about his new product. And look at the words that he uses. Of course, new is not a buzzword, but interactive, entertainment experience, groundbreaking, innovative, genre-defining features. Sounds wonderful, but what does it mean? What is genre defining? And especially when every product that comes out claims to be innovative, cutting edge, genre breaking, whatever. So we start to get this idea of a buzzword. Now what is a buzzword? A buzzword is something you hear over and over again until it becomes meaningless. A holistic approach. What? Or in my field of education, things like cutting edge, student-centered, are buzzwords. I wonder if any of you have buzzwords in your experiences. Anybody in the audience like to contribute a buzzword that you run across day after day? That doesn't mean much? Yes? The whole of government, the whole of government approach, right? Right, good one. Anybody else? Yes? What's that? Oh yes, the state of the art. Exactly, very good, that's right. What does that mean, right? What's another one? Public-private partnership, exactly. Partnership is another word that starts to be, what are you talking about? Uh, Chai Wong, do you have any? A win-win, yes? World-class. We're surrounded by buzzwords and one of them is collaboration. Now, about 40 years ago, this man, Robert Chambers, wrote a wonderful book called Managing Rural Development. And along the way, he said he thought that consultants continually recommended more coordination and more integration among the various government agencies doing rural development. And yet they never explained who was supposed to be coordinated how, or what was supposed to be integrated at what cost. And Chambers concluded, that the value of consultants' reports is inversely proportional to the number of times they use the word coordination and integration. And collaboration is itself a buzzword, not just in government, not just with NGOs, but also in business. Now you think about people talking about mergers of companies, and they talk about win-win, right? One plus one equals three, meaning if we just put together my research and development department with your marketing department, just imagine how good we would be because I'm weak in marketing and you're a little bit weak in R&D. So just imagine if we put it together. But sometimes it doesn't come out that way. Here's a story I call the Shaw and the Dancer story. The picture here is Isadora Duncan, a world famous dancer years ago. You can see she's quite beautiful. And she was also a little bit naughty. With this man, George Bernard Shaw, who was much older than she, the great writer, gnarly, a little bit ugly, she would flirt with him incessantly. She would rub up against him like a cat. She would bat her eyes at him. And one night at a dinner with lots of other people present, she sat across the table from him and kept touching his ankles with her ankles and finally boldly said to him at the table in front of the others, oh Bernard, wouldn't it be wonderful if you and I should have a child? Just imagine your brain and my body. 
And Shaw gave an answer which became one of the most famous one-liners of his era. What if it should turn out the other way around? <laughs> and with mergers, sometimes it turns out the other way around. We get your R&D department and my marketing department, rather than the planned for synergies and one plus one equals three that we hoped for. And so my first point tonight is that we must be wary of collaboration as a buzzword. Collaboration is always costly. Always costly. There are direct costs in time and energy, and there are indirect costs in the deviation of your organization from its principal purpose while it tries to collaborate with my organization. And therefore, collaboration is not a panacea. I don't want anyone leaving tonight saying, oh, the professor was saying if we just had more collaboration, in all circumstances, everything would be fine. And that's not what I'm saying. The burden of proof to have more collaboration is with the person proposing the collaboration to show that the benefits outweigh the costs. My first point. My second point is, and yet, if we look at the major problems and opportunities facing Bhutan, our region, and I would argue our world, many of them will require more collaboration for us to succeed. More collaboration between local government and national government, more collaboration across ministries, and our topic tonight, more collaboration across the public, private, nonprofit divide. Here are some examples. If we look at, uh, whoops, if we look at uh, rural development, to get rural development truly to happen, it can't just have health. It can't just be agriculture. It has to have things in an integrated fashion that feed off each other and create the motor of development, the infrastructure, the health, the education, the cultural affairs, the environmental concerns. In fact, a lesson about rural development all over the world is two things. This is interesting. The first one is mobilized demand. We can provide a public service and people don't use it. It's an amazing fact all over the world. We have water pumps that remain unmaintained all over the world. We have health clinics that are not attended to by the people. So mobilizing demand is one crucial element. And the other one, the lesson from around the world, is we have to integrate supply. So when we think about rural development, if we have two lessons, mobilize demand, integrate supply. Now, urban development is another obvious example where we need to integrate across the public-private nonprofit divide. Because the public services we provide must be tailored to the uses that the people want and need. People meaning residents, people meaning businesses. And it's very important, therefore, to mobilize energies that are collaborative to plan and implement, implement urban development. This is true here in Bhutan and it's true all over the world. I'll have a wonderful example for you later about delivery of urban services where a public-private partnership played an absolutely crucial role. And then finally at the national level, if we have a short list of the problems facing Bhutan, and let me say, not say problems, let me say opportunities facing Bhutan, youth employment, public and private sector must be involved, plus education, if we talk about hydropower, you already have a lot of public-private as well as international partnerships here. If we talk about roads and infrastructure, where we have these massive efforts going on to build that all over the country, and it's absolutely crucial. You know, an advisor to Margaret Thatcher 25 years ago when he stepped down as her advisor on international development was interviewed by the BBC. And they asked him, so, if you have to leave now and give one thing that's the most important thing for rural development, what is it? And he said, rural roads. And so he explained why. And the interviewer, not a very bright interviewer, said, well, what's the second most important thing? And he said, rural roads. And it's also the third most important thing. So that was his perspective. If you think about tourism, obviously public, private have to be involved there as well. And finally, the biggest challenge or the biggest opportunity you have of them all, in my humble opinion as your friend and admirer, is this one. How do you create an environment for development for all of your people and provide leadership in a world that needs your example by combining two things that are often in tension? 
the preservation and expansion of your values and culture and the mobilization of all the world's knowledge and creativity to your people. How do we preserve and expand what we're good at at the same time that we open up to all the knowledge and all the thoughts of the world? That's a great challenge for Bhutan. And I think that challenge will also require a remarkable amount of collaboration across various sectors of society. Now, the good news is that there are lots of things going on in the world right now, I'll just quickly review a few of them, that provide, I would say, new hope for enhancing governance and new opportunities and challenges for leadership. Let me give you a few examples. First, well-known are public-private partnerships of the kind you might see in infrastructure. We, thank you. Uh, do you think, does it sound like I need it? Maybe I, my, is my voice rasping here? Uh, so public-private partnerships are expanding. If you look at the websites of the governments around the world and, and see almost every agency, every ministry will talk about public-private partnerships. Here are a few examples of the kinds of functions in my country and around the world that are increasingly subject to not just government doing it or not just privatizing and let the market do it, but some side of collaborative governance is going on. And speaking of that word collaborative governance, here's a book from two professors at Harvard that came out from Princeton University Press in 2011. You can look at it online and see a lot of it there. They're arguing that this is the future, collaborative governance, public roles for uh, pro public goals and private roles. And then as this book came out last year, one I use in my course on collaboration, from the Harvard Business School Press by two business consultants. And look at the subtitle here. The, the Solution Revolution is about how public, private, and nonprofit are taking on not just a few little problems, but big, hairy, chronic problems. Again, this book, a lot of this is available online. You can look it up afterwards. Another example is in private charity. Now, you may know the term corporate social responsibility. When a company devotes 1% or 2% of its revenues to helping the communities in which it works, helping the schools where its factories are located, or helping clinics in the areas it works. And the idea is it builds goodwill, and it provides a certain reaction in case local people are complaining about your oil refinery, or your polluting factory, or your Starbucks buying of coffee. The movement that's being described now is from corporate social responsibility to creating shared value. And what this means is the difference between Starbucks putting up a school for the farmers in the area it's buying coffee, to Starbucks doing something that its company has a comparative advantage in. What is quality coffee and what's the best way to grow it? And helping farmers grow even better quality coffee. They make more money, Starbucks gets better coffee. Both sides are happy. They're creating shared value. And therefore, it becomes more of a business proposition and not a little backwater in the company, the, the 1% or 2%. If you look at the World Economic Forum website, you'll see an amazing episode from a couple of years ago where the president of Pepsi-Cola, who's an Indian, described her company's creating shared value in India. This movement is underway. And it's another example of partnership where charity is not just tossing money out, but it's a partnership between the recipient and the, quote, donor. Another example is social entrepreneurship or civic entrepreneurship. This diagram, a little bit mystifying, I guess we'll put this up later for people to see on the website here. For, but you can see that on the demand side and on the supply side, I'm getting a little feedback here, on the demand side and the supply side, there are different kinds of actors here. And what a civic entrepreneur does is gets in and tries to connect the supply and the demand at the local level with that nice circle at the bottom where you engage citizens, you provide things, and you get these nice feedback loops of learning and providing. In my country, but also in many developing countries with things from waste management to rural credit, the entrepreneurs are not business people or government agencies, but social entrepreneurs who are creating market-like solutions for chronic problems. And let me just list a few more. I'll talk a little bit later about convenings, which is one of the ones I'm most excited about, 
where you get together people from public, private, and nonprofit at very high levels, and you give them facts about the local situation, examples from other countries who have faced that problem and done well, and some sort of analytical framework that will help people locate the problem in a different way, reframe the problem, and then in a safe place, let them do some creative problem solving that they wouldn't have done otherwise and that no outsider could do. I've seen this work. You may have seen deliberation councils all over Southeast Asia. It's a case where business and government get together and thrash out priorities for the country, sometimes in a quite informal way and sometimes in Singapore, with formal councils that help the government decide on its long-term investment program. And then in areas such as contests, it's exciting right now in my country how much both private entrepreneurs and social philanthropists and the government agencies are opening up big problems like um, malaria vaccinations or other really hard problems to contests where they offer a prize for people like you and me and other, uh, others to try to come forth with solutions. And sometimes they are crowdsourced solutions. And we're seeing this take on many important problems in our countries. So you can see there's a lot, I could give you five more interesting examples right now of things that look so different from should the government do it or should the private sector do it? Rather something quite different that are more like hybrids or partnerships or collaboration. Now what's the big idea behind collaboration? There are various types of institutions. There's government, oh sorry, there's business, there's government, and there's civil society organizations. Those are nonprofit collective organizations without, that are more, higher, uh, more horizontally organized and that have the interests of certain groups of people or certain regions in mind. And then there are types of goods. There are private goods, public goods, and what might be called common property resources, and then various hybrids that are depicted in this picture, which shows the triangle of government business, civil society, and various blends where two of the three partners will work together. And you see, for example, toll goods, where a private company and a government will work together to develop a toll road, privately managed, but govern government administration is also important. And these various hybrids also play a role in solving public problems. So various kinds of institutions, various kinds of goods, and Here's the basic diagnosis. Governments are good at some things. Businesses are good at other things, particularly designing high-powered marketing and incentive systems. And nonprofits are good at other things. And I want to notice one in particular here. We talked earlier about mobilizing demand. This is what citizens groups are very good at. Women's groups, farmers groups, sheep, shepherds groups, religious groups. Oftentimes, they can mobilize demand, spread the word credibly among local people to help them use services. And so it goes that generally when we talk about public goods, we have government do that. When we have private goods, we have the private sector, that is business, do that. And when we have these collective uh, common property goods, then we have the NGOs and civil society organizations do that. But interestingly, most of our challenging problems require all three kinds of goods. Here's a picture of people working on the second green revolution, you know, where they have the high-powered seeds plus associated programs of fertilizers, crop science, agri agricultural extension, and marketing. And all those things have distinctive advantages. Governments are particularly good at setting up legal frameworks and funding R&D. Private sector is very good at taking products and marketing them, getting it out. NGOs are needed to help the farmers mobilize demand for these new products, understand the new practices, and make it credible. And so, since so many problems require all three kinds of goods, they also require all three kinds of institutions somehow to work without tripping over each other. Now, we reason together, therefore, when we solve public issues. Here's the chain I'd like you to think about. What is the problem we have? Or what is the opportunity we face? What kinds of goods will it take 
to make that happen. What private goods, what public goods, what collective property, common property goods, and so forth. Third, what kinds of institutions are best suited to provide those goods? And then finally, how can we organize some sort of collaboration so that happens, so we don't just have one person try to do it? And then, of course, the one we're talking about tonight is this step. How do we make it happen? How do leaders and managers actually turn from a good idea to something that actually works? So, the challenges to make it work really fall in four categories. The first one is that institutions have their own cultures, their own languages, their own attitudes toward measurement and outcomes, the way they deal with each other. And so many times you find people in a partnership coming home from a meeting and telling their husband or wife, you wouldn't believe this person in business. All they think about is money. Or you wouldn't believe this person in government. All they think about is does it follow the rules? Or you wouldn't believe these people in the NGOs. All they have are these big fuzzy ideas about helping people, but they don't want to count anything and they don't want to follow the rules. And people get frustrated with each other because they don't understand the culture. But it's also true, by the way, across government agencies and even within a government agency. For example, the R&D types and the marketing types, or in a health ministry, the prevention types and the curative types, or in education, the people working on primary education, people working on higher education, they're like different animals, different cultures. And we're not very good at cultural sensitivity. The first step is to realize that there are cultural differences. So when somebody does something that we don't understand, we don't just say, boy, what an idiot that person is. We say, what is the culture in which that makes sense? How can I listen even more carefully and listen to this? How can I express my ideas in their language? Second step, resources for collaboration. Now, if I tell you tomorrow, do you have time to come to six meetings next week to talk about an interesting problem? Most of us would say no. Most of us are fully busy, fully employed. And so if we're asked to do something additional to collaborate, it is an imposition. One person said, if you want collaboration, the best way to do it is to have a pot of money in the middle of the table that people can share. Now that's a metaphor. It means that we need free resources to help people with the additional burdens of collaboration. It's not free. And those resources include management resources. Some of the recent writing on public, private, nonprofit collaboration advocates what is called a backbone organization, which sits above the three types of institutions and provides some basic management, accounting, planning tools and functions so that no one organization has to try to absorb that into itself. A specialized backbone organization may be a crucial resource for complicated public, private, nonprofit collaboration. Now the third area that is difficult is this one. How do you communicate and negotiate? The tendencies are something like this. You have one side that is saying, I am in my own silo, I have my own understood mission, and I have my own rules of engagement. Versus something we're trying to seek, which is an outcome orientation. Something which is, we're worried about something which is good for your ministry, or good for your business, or good for your NGO. It's not that you have to sacrifice, but we have to get something that's, view, that's viewing the goal as being outside of each one of our individual organizations. And the final one is people and skills. One of the big lessons of studies of successful public-private nonprofit collaboration is how much they depend on personal relationships. How important it is for the leaders of the organizations to assume, to not assume that it's like inside their organization where they can get orders and incentives and information flowing and things will happen. So much more is making sure you're talking, communicating, building trust. Because there's so many dangers of misunderstanding. And also skills of setting specific targets. So it doesn't just become a grand game of just talking about things and getting consensus. It actually is decision oriented. The crucial areas in collaboration are designing who does what. What are you good at? What are you good at? What am I good at? And doing that together. Getting tangible, results-oriented targets. And finally, what Jim Collins calls level five leadership. 
you can look him up on the web. Jim Collins, the author of From Good to Great, has a wonderful hierarchy of types of leaders, and the one many people think of as the leader is his type four. The handsome or beautiful person, eloquent, always in charge, domineering, um, charismatic. And Collins found the very best companies were not led by level four leaders. They were led by level five leaders who have two characteristics. They are relentlessly pursuing the goal. They have the goal in mind and they don't forget it. Friedrich Nietzsche once said, the reason, I'll, I'll, par I'll paraphrase, he said, the reason we don't succeed is we forget what we're trying to do. He wasn't joking. We're mowing along and then after three days we go, what, what was I trying to do again? I forgot. And these are relentlessly pursuing the goal. And secondly, they are humble. Now, humble doesn't mean you roll over people or they roll over you. It doesn't mean I just go, oh, whatever you want. Not that kind of humility. Humility, which means it's not about me. When I get up to give a speech as a level four leader, it might be about me. The level five leader gets up, it's about the goal. And so everything is directed toward that. He doesn't care if other people get credit. He wants other people to participate as takes their back, holds them up, lets them take risks. And what we need in this game of collaborative leadership is more of that level, level five humility. So let me talk about what we have to build on. It sounds daunting, doesn't it? We've got cultural problems, resource problems, communication problems, and people and skills, so it's difficult. But fortunately, there are many examples we can learn from around the world now of successful collaborative arrangements. And there are incipient models and analytical frameworks we can use as well, some of the books I mentioned to you earlier. Plus, there are even toolkits that you can use for training people. For example, this year, I guess last year, the, the Good Project at Harvard, isn't that a wonderful name? The Good Project it has such things as what is a good career, what is good work, and another of its branches is, what is good collaboration? And they came out last year with the Good Collaboration Toolkit. So we've got the tools. But in our management schools, in our governance institutes, in our business schools, are we teaching this? Are we teaching the skills of leadership across collaborative arrangements and management? I don't think so. I think we're lagging best practice here. So let me talk about a few examples that might be relevant for Bhutan. These are three of many, and I hope that you'll have some thoughts after I finish. The first one is how collaboration can improve public services. The second one is improving procurement through collaboration. And the final one is convenings on big issues facing the country. Let's take the first one, public services. This is Samuel Paul, who is the founder. He's, despite his name, he's an Indian from the south of India. Uh, he founded something called the Public Affairs Center in Bangalore, now called Bengaluru as of a week ago. Official name has changed. And in Bangalore, as you might know now, is the Silicon Valley of India. But then it was just starting to be that kind of place. And Paul's idea was we should get credible information from the citizens about the quality of the services being provided by each of the government agencies. So we'll set up a series of interviews and censuses done by private polling firms. And we'll also get objective indicators such as when we call up how many times, is, how long does it take before people answer the phone? When we send a letter, do we ever get an answer? How long does it take? And putting together these things, they developed scorecards and report cards which first they shared with the ministries. They didn't go out and slam people in the face. They first came to the minister and said, here's our results, what do you think? And the ministers never said, by the way, this is completely false. They said, I'm surprised it's that bad. And so from here, the idea was they could try to build something that would <clears throat> ask what reforms would make this better? How can we speed up services and how can we control corruption by making things more transparent? Those were the goals. Progress didn't happen until this man came to power, new chief minister, and he looked around at his situation and he saw a great opportunity for partnership. What did he have? 
He had good objective measures, not provided by the government agencies themselves, of how well they were performing. Isn't that wonderful to have something like that? He had the government ministers who were now used to these surveys and were thinking about how they can improve. And he had Microsoft and Unisys and all these companies that were demanding better public services and had a lot of resources, both financial and management resources. And so he put together the Bangalore Area Task Force, Task Agenda. And it included people from government, business, and civil society. It was, the idea was to improve the infrastructure, by which I mean power, water, roads, and so forth, but also to reduce the corruption that was going on in the city. And the big thought was, if we can help the agencies in their reforms through more private participation and monitor the progress through the NGOs, we can do something that'll be transformative. And so each of these parties had its own advantages. They looked and saw what kinds of goods do we need and who can provide it. We need good, credible information about what is going on at the ground. Who knows that? The citizens. We need resources that can't be provided through government agencies about IT, management training, project design, even identifying of outstanding uh, personnel. The private sector knows how to do that. And the government itself, with a unifying vision across the various ministries, could look at ways to combine forces and to force an agenda that would be transformative. And this happened. By 2011, the Indian government produced a report that said the BATF had revolutionized public services in India. Now, the ingredients for success it demands this kind of arrangement, where the government is good at some things and insists upon some things, particularly notice that the chief minister insisted that the strategies for each ministry be vetted with the BATF, with business and citizen groups present. It was no longer an internal operation. It was out in the open, including in front of the other ministers. The private sector, sorry, civil society could provide the report cards, the actual measures of results. The press was very important in this, publicizing things. And finally, the private sector provided resources and skills. What made it work? Collaboration across the public-private divide. It took a vision. It took management skills and leadership. And everybody was better off. Each organization was better off, even in its own definition of better off. So two other examples I'll mention briefly. One is from the Philippines under President Aquino, and the other is from Peru. And they're both sensational examples. I wish I had a lot of time to tell you about it. Those of you who are in the senior executive leadership program, maybe we can talk about this a little bit more over the next three days. I'll look forward to that. The Philippines, there's a man named Jesse Stanislao, former university president, former minister of government, who in 2004 set up something called mm, the Asia, I'll think of the name just a second. Um, and the, the, the motto of this organization is, let's make governance a shared responsibility. The vehicle, once again, was scorecards at the city level, which it programmed in various parts of the Philippines and made it successful. Even had some ISO type of certification for cities and had a lot of case studies of beneficent feedback loops, including mayors winning elections. So this was good for them to do. 2010, Benigno Aquino III comes to power in a very important election where his campaign pledge was when there's no more corruption, there'll be no more poverty. And so anti-corruption was a crucial feature of his government. And what he did was he took these scorecards developed by business people, instituted with, citizens, uh, with cities, and put this as a framework for all of government reform, outcome-oriented governance. If you look at the Philippine Civil Service website, you'll see an incredible rollout effort that's been going year after year with training programs. They even call them boot camps to get this thing implemented. Private sector was really good at getting this going. Citizen, cities made it happen as experiment stations. Of course, citizens were the people providing all the information. And then when it took a visionary leader like President Aquino to transform this into something which I believe is making, already making a huge difference in the Philippines. For example, by 2012, two years after he took power, it was the fastest growing middle income country in 
Asia, including beating out China by 0.1 percentage points in growth. The second example is from Ciudadanos al Día, which means roughly citizens up to date. Here's a picture of their founder, Beatriz Bosa. Beatriz is a polymath, uh, everything from a law professor to a governor of the central bank. And she set up this NGO in the early 2000s, and it had some crucial goals. First, could we create measures of citizen satisfaction with city agencies and various agencies of government? And a little bit like these other cases, using the private sector to take citizen feedback and then do interviews and then bring these up, but working very closely with the press from the beginning. They went to the newspapers and said, if we come out every three months with a ranking of all the cities in Peru, would you publish it? They said, yes. So page three has this huge ranking of all the cities. I think it's over 100 cities from the best to the worst, green, yellow, and red. And if you're in the red zone, you might go, oh, this is unfair, what are you doing? But this is objective information by citizens in your city. And it's done by a private firm who has no particular political party in mind. So first thing was credible information, but they didn't stop there. The second thing was prizes for good government. And you have to see this to believe it. I was here last March and I saw, what was it, Bhutan Superstar on television, right? The singing. And you know, we have American Idol, but we don't have good government idol. We don't do that. But they do it there. On prime time, once a year, they take some of the cities that have been most improved, they do this for government agencies and for hospitals, the ones that are most improved, and they give it to a panel of experts like you, take maybe eight or 10 of these cities, and you judge it, and then you give three finalists to a panel that is more photogenic and famous, former president, a movie star, famous soccer player, um, and so forth. And they take these cases and judge them. And then they have a TV show, okay, where they have the three finalists. Imagine the mayor of Piura, the mayor of Cusco, the mayor of Trujillo are all there. And they're being interviewed beforehand. Mayor, are you excited? Yes, I'm here. My family's here. We have been doing so many wonderful things in Trujillo. I hope we win the award. And then they bring out the envelope. And the movie star says, and the winner is Trujillo. And the mayor goes, yes. Well, he actually goes, see, sí. right? And he gets up and celebrates, and then they interview him, and they get a lot of acclaim. They don't stop there. The third thing they do is they study what these cities have done to turn things around, or these government agencies. And they study it by offices. For example, land registries. How do they do that? Revenue collection, better public services in water, and so forth. And they put out, they now have on their website, over 1,200 good practices, which they've turned into checklists. So if they come to your land registry in your city and you want to improve, they've got a series of 10 or 12 things they can deduce from successful practice, which might be good guidelines for you. Not to copy, but to inspire you to do better yourself. And they don't stop there. They offer technical assistance and consulting services so that if you're a city that's in the red, and you want to improve yourself, they come out and say, yes, if you pay for it, we'll do a special survey for you. And then we'll show you these best practices and train your staff so you can learn from the best, not in the world, not what's going on in France, not what worked in the United States, but what worked in Peru. Isn't that wonderful? So great examples of a NGO, private sector, government partnership, which is combining the best of all these different worlds the vision of having a TV show to celebrate success, to me, is a great idea. Now, a second area where we might take uh, inspiration in Bhutan is in procurement reform. I'm gonna give you two examples of procurement reform. First one is in Colombia for bridge and road building. It's a case where it wasn't working well, there was lots of problems in terms of uh, systemic corruption. And what they did is they invited the private sector one-on-one -on -one to participate in interviews where the point was not to say, did Klitgard take a bribe? Did Klitgard give a bribe? It wasn't that, it wasn't personalized. It was an analysis of the system. Here's how the system is supposed to work from pre-qualification to the design of the specification of the contract to the awarding of the contract to the payment of the contract and the ex post change orders. Here's how it's supposed to work. How does it really work in practice? And when they interviewed these guys, 
one-on-one, -on -one, confidentially, maybe 15 or 20 people from the road building industry, they got a picture of how the parallel system worked. And once they had that parallel system described, they called together the business people and the government and said, here are the problems we see, that is, you have seen, how can we work together to make the system work better? And by the way, in another year, we're gonna do another of these surveys with the business people. And it worked. Another example, following this same example, is going on right now in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which as you know, is the Northwest Frontier Province, renamed. It's where Imran Khan, the cricket player, is now the chief minister, and he's been an ardent opponent of corruption. And desiring to improve public services there, he took two areas as priorities. One was education, and the other is public health, the clinics. Both were suffering from grave procurement problems with insider trading, poor deliveries, too much pricing, poor quality, and so forth. And they did the same thing they did in Colombia. They went to the private sector people that participated and said, listen, I don't really want to know if you've ever paid a bribe or ever who's taking bribes. Maybe everybody has to pay bribes. I don't care. Let's talk about where the systemic weaknesses are. And then once we get that picture, let's sit down and see if we can make it better. In this case, one of the partners is the World Bank. And the World Bank has the money, that pot of money in the middle of the table, that will enable the collaboration, inshallah, to proceed and clean up those systems. Now, the third example of public-private collaboration I'd like to raise is more speculative, but to me more exciting. And this is what I call convenings. What is a convening? A convening is where we get together the people from the public, private, and nonprofit sector, or at least we get the people from all the government ministries, confidentially together, and we look at research that describes data about how that country or ministry or whatever stands, that sector, to an example of success in another country on a similar problem that makes progress, which the participants work through together, almost like students. And then third, actual frameworks and models and theories that will help people reframe this issue. And if you do that in a safe place, you end up with great new ideas that they would not have had alone and certainly no outsider like me ever could have had, which lead oftentimes to collaboration. So, conclusions. First, collaboration can just be a buzzword. So many of the things in our lives that we value most can become buzzwords. Have you thought of that? Love, awareness, faith. Those are all things that we can start to use as words without even thinking about it, what they really mean. And collaboration is one of those. Collaboration always has costs and therefore we do not advocate collaboration as a panacea. And yet, I hope I've persuaded you, at least given you the glimmer that there are many things going on in the world right now that suggest that on very many important problems that face our country and the rest of the world, it's going to be collaboration across the public policy, a public-private divide, and this is going to really redefine what we mean by public policy. Redefine what we mean by good governments, governance, and redefine what we mean by leadership. It expands the tool set of things we need to know to do a better job. Third, we can learn from things that are already happening that are working. We don't have to imagine, well, I wish we had some better answers here. We have inspiring examples and new analytical frameworks that don't lead automatically to an answer for us, but that we can use in convenings in ways that we can get uh, answers that are more suited to our realities. And our challenge for leaders is to work from problems back to collaboration. We start with problems, or as I like to put it, opportunities. What are the challenges? What kinds of goods are needed if we optimally solve that problem? What private goods, what public goods, what collective goods, and so forth? Which institutions, in theory, could provide those best? And how might we imagine collaboration across those institutions working? 
How can we set up targets? How can we set up resources? How can we set up information and incentive flows that will make that collaboration work? That's the first challenge for leaders. Second one is communication across institutional cultures. We all, if we're going to get into this game, we need to learn new languages. We need to learn to listen differently to what other people say. I love a line that the president of USC, Steve Sample, had in his book about management written with Warren Bennis. He had this simple line which was, don't judge people until you have to. How many times do we get in trouble by just, we hear something, we go, oh, that person's an idiot, that person's good, this person's bad. But oftentimes if they're speaking a different language from us, we're prematurely judging them. And so don't judge people until you have to. We need to find resources to enable collaboration. In the Philippines, where they started off when Aquino came to power, three weeks after his election, everybody sat down and said, now what do we do? We promised to clean up corruption, what do we do? So they had a meeting at Malacanang Palace for a whole day on Saturday, a secret meeting, where they were wearing golf shirts, where they did exactly what I'm just talking about. They got data from, that located where their problems were on this specter, an example of a country that was dealing with systemic corruption that succeeded, that they worked through in the fashion that the students are going to work through this on Sunday. Students here will work through this exact case. You will be the cabinet of the Philippines, if you will. And then frameworks that help redefine the problems they were facing. An imaginary news story that said, here's how Philippines might be successful five years from now, and then people had to think, how could we get there? And thus stimulated, this cabinet worked until 8.30 at night and got the principles of a reform program, deputed three ministers to develop it and give it to the president on Tuesday, and that was the beginning of action. The things they came up with, no outsider could have done, and I think they couldn't have done it by themselves one-on-one. -on -one. It was the collaborative problem solving that made it really uh, incredibly successful. Finding the resources then, the second time this, they got together uh, with the outside person there was uh, 13 or 14 months later. Now it was a public meeting, 45 people came, television cameras and so forth. They were very proud of themselves. And uh, at this meeting, what came out were six task forces. And you know what one of the task forces was? How do we use foreign aid even better? How do we mobilize external resources? And what they did three days later Three or four of these ministers went, they called a meeting of World Bank, Asian Development Bank, France, Japan, all these people came, I think 40 donors came, and the ministers explained what they were trying to do. They communicated and what challenges they still faced. For example, to get the NGOs even more involved in monitoring public programs, the government couldn't provide money for that because it would contaminate the independence of the NGOs. Would you please fund that, you donors? Yes, they said. And millions more dollars came in because they sat down with the donors and said, to do these things, here's what we're trying to do, here's the vision, isn't it exciting? We need your help. Can you provide resources to make this kind of collaboration possible? And in my experience, what happened in the Philippines can happen elsewhere. That is, the answer could be yes. Enhancing flows of information and incentives within and across agencies is so important. Aligning flows of good information about what's actually happening with the incentives that people face is the ingredient of effective reform in business and in public-private partnerships. People and skills. We need people with different kinds of skills that we normally teach in business schools or in public policy schools or in schools of public health or schools of education. And finally, are there some special opportunities for places like RIGS? Could RIGS be a place that provides more of these skills of leadership across the public-private divide? Could RIGS be a venue for the kinds of convenings I've been talking about on important issues facing the country? And finally, where are the targets of opportunity for Bhutan? If we had to sit down and name three opportunities that are high profile potential where we think we could get some partnerships and some resources to make a difference that people would see, what would those three things be? Not 10 things, 
but three things. That's a great exercise for a cabinet to work on. It's a great exercise for you as intellectuals. And here we have in this room people from the public, private, nonprofit, academic worlds. It's a great challenge for us. Well, let me stop there. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and now turn it over to your questions and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, we hear so many terms like united we stand, divided we fall, collective responsibility. Yet when, we, when it comes to actions, sometimes we are so busy trying our best to do whatever we are doing to, and uh, we forget to collaborate at times. And thank you very much for the reminder. Um, uh, just uh, so uh, as Professor has also mentioned, we can, the floor is now open for questions. Um, the mic start work as soon as I start moving. Um, yes. uh, thank you, Professor, for um, for the very skillful way in which you um, which you brought up the topic and walked us through the the pitfalls of using buzzwords and actually falling into that trap, and yet um, showing collaboration as a way forward. Uh, I think that was very skillfully done and. Uh, I uh, thank you for that. Um, my, uh, it's not exactly a question as such, but a request would be um, if you could uh, talk a little, share a little bit uh, more about how a collaboration uh, between the public and the private could be done to deepen democracy. I'm myself a, a, a proud participant of the CELP. And I know over the next three days, we will have opportunity to discuss this further. But uh, because the, there's a much wider audience here, and perhaps that would uh, be of um, great benefit and uh, to, to actually hear from you in terms of collaboration to deepen democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Deepen democracy can mean many things. Let me take a, a superficial definition and maybe all of us have a deeper, really deeper one. But the one I'll talk about is elections themselves. Isn't it amazing around the world how many elections are full of problems? I mean full of fraud, uh, full of intimidation, full of false ballots and uh, long lines. It seems like they're so poorly managed. If we could run an election the way we run a store, we wouldn't have two hour waits to vote in the steaming sun. And yet people come out to vote. So we see the success stories in terms of managing elections have many features of public-private nonprofit partnerships. It's not just the Independent Election Commission doing its thing. You have citizens groups, often international actors as well, monitoring, watching what's going on. Nowadays we have cell phones taking pictures. We have people doing undercover work, you know, as private citizens. We could imagine business people playing a bigger role saying, how do we get these lines to be shorter? That's what you guys are good at, right? So I think that we could imagine 10 years from now, elections could be a lot better done if we have even more collaboration across the public, private, nonprofit divide. Let me leave the deeper dimensions of democratization to a discussion maybe we could have afterwards. Maybe you could identify yourself when you make your point, please. That would be nice. Thank you. Good evening, sir. It was a beautiful session. Uh, thank you very much for giving a light on buzzword. I too was very confused, you know, before this, but it was really very good. Sir, um, uh, it actually, uh, uh, the, you know, it's going on in my mind that after going through your, you know, uh, lecture, it comes to me that um, 
isn't it that the lecture is a biased lecture for example you are asking you know a uh, public private partnership and uh, then you know at the end the story ends with beautiful things that all the efforts will surely bring the results is it that you are asking uh, us to go for a risk taking i mean a risk is always there and uh, the the you know the real fact of the life is that it's not the efforts which are paid it's actually the result which is paid so um, i want to get some light on that thank you so let me see if I can re-express your question in a way I can actually answer it. Uh, it's always good to be able to have the microphone where I can rephrase the question and answer it uh, myself. Let's uh, take an analogy here of someone who has a um, particular injury, has just had an injury where they're now in a wheelchair and it's going to be a long recovery back to walking and uh, becoming normal again. And they can get very depressed. And something can happen, it'll be denial. And the other thing will happen is hopelessness. And so it's wonderful at that point to have peer counseling where someone who has been through that three years ago had the same accident and is now walking nicely can come tell you how she did it, not to make you take any risks or be like her, but the fact she did it is a wonderful thing. With addictions, it's also true. With obesity, it's also true. The first thing we have to face up to our addiction or face up to our problem, but it's not enough just to say, oh man, I'm, I'm an addict. We need then examples of things that actually have been able to overcome it and maybe a framework that will help us rethink the problem as more than just my own moral failing, more something else. And so the examples I gave you today are not saying every time we have a public-private partnership for public services, it will work. Not at all. I'm trying to provide some examples to inspire you to say, wow, this could work. This has worked. It's made a difference. What skills do we need? What convenings do we need? What cross-cultural communications do we need? What resources do we need? So that we can try to make that happen ourselves. We will always have to figure it out for ourselves. But we can be inspired by examples of success and we can be instructed by frameworks that help us rethink the problem in different ways. And so that's my theory about a lot of things when we need to have change. We need to recognize our problem, and that's where the data comes in to help us locate our problem and our opportunity. We need examples of other people who have faced similar problems and succeeded. And then we need some kind of framework that suggests here are the routines, here are the methods, here are the steps that you should think through together to address the problems for your own specific, inevitably unique circumstances. Please identify yourself, what your name and where you're from. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Leto. I have come from Sabdu Jonkar. Uh, I look after a mining company. Uh, thank you for that very enlightening uh, speech. Uh, I was thinking that uh, why is it that we fail to collaborate, we fail to come together and achieve a desired result. So I was thinking that primarily there are three stumbling blocks that sort of keeps ourselves from coming together. Probably number one is the mindset of the people. I think somehow by nature we are individualistic and then we would not like to come together. Second would be, as Professor Riley said, that it is that pot of money on the table that is lacking amongst ourselves. And third, and probably the most important would be that we are not sure of the end result, the outcome. I think these are three stumbling blocks that I think keeps amongst ourselves to come together. So I just wanted to get your views on these three. Thank you. I think you're exactly right. Those are the three. Probably a few more, but those are three good ones. The first one is akin to a problem that we all have in our personal lives. We tend to be looking down instead of out. And when Buddhists teach about awareness, isn't that what it's about? It's about looking out and up and not just down at what we're doing, not just be creatures of routine. And so in our specialties, in our valid work that we're doing inside our ministries or our companies or our CSOs, we tend to look down, we don't tend to look out. And what the examples provide is, wow, I mean, I could look out, and then 
How do we do that? What would it take to do that, apart from just a pot of money? What are the steps we could look at that would help us identify our problem more clearly, think about the kinds of goods that are needed to address that problem, think about the institutions that could provide those goods, and then looking at theory and examples, how could we design those partnerships so they actually work? So the results we get will not be your third category of some surprises that might go, oh my goodness, I wish we'd never started this. We get Shaw and the dancer, right? Hi, Professor. Hello. My name is Adrian. I'm a son of Singapore, and I can't help but listen to your wonderful lecture with uh, a very real concern for my, for my own country uh, in Singapore. Um, my question for you is, is a hunch that I have. Uh, I hope you can help me answer that. Is there, a, is there evidence for, in your research that hints at a leadership type that would work well behind the scene uh, it's kind of like a number two kind of a leader because it seems to me that uh, um, the benevolent kind of, there seems to be an important benevolent but coercive force that's needed to, in order to get everybody together. Um, that seems to be what um, is required to start it off, this collaboration. But I'm wondering in the long run, is it better not to work behind the scenes to be more facilitative, more invisible? Do you have evidence in your research to show us that um, this kind of leaders are very much uh, effective as well as the benevolent, coercive ones? Now, it's a great question. The answer, short answer is I don't have the evidence. So I, I, would, I, I would agree with your hypothesis, though. If you're expressing that as a hypothesis, I think the, uh, the hypothesis I would draw based on other evidence is this level five leadership idea, where there is a relentless pursuit of the goal. Now, why those people have that pursuit of the goal is another matter. Why is this person, why is Lee Kuan Yew the way he was? What, you know, who knows why that is? But the relentless pursuit with a certain amount of humility, now I'm not saying Lee Kuan Yew had a lot of humility, but um, the, the level, level five leaders are people who are content to do things behind the scenes. And when you talk to their uh, people that work with them, they'll say, she was always covering my back. She was always enabling me to take risks. She was always giving me the credit. And that's the kind of person that you're willing to really collaborate with and for. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, professor, my name is Ugin Doji, and I'm a, I'm a project manager in uh, uh, Bhutan Power Corporation. Um, I have my, uh, I have, uh, I would like to actually ask one question and maybe I'll ask for a, uh, some suggestion from, uh, from you, sir. The first one is, uh, <clears throat> so you mentioned about uh, some, some problems or maybe uh, opportunities uh, with regard in context of our country. That is, if I'm not mistaken, one is improving the public services. Uh, the other one, second one is improving the procurement reforms. And the third one is convening for, to address the big opportunities. So this is basically, uh, I think you mentioned in the context of our country. I'd just like to clarify, uh, clarify, Professor, whether th these are the problems that you came across or you thought that these are the problems that our country is facing today. That's my first uh, part of my question. The second one is uh, regarding the leadership that uh, uh, through the, for the public and private divide, that, uh, that's the topic of the the lecture today, and uh, you uh, rightly mentioned about the uh, the Starbucks, you know, doing some CSR, trying to help the farmers grow good coffee, and then must pro uh, likewise the Starbucks themselves could uh, give good coffee to the people. The the job uh, responsibility that I have, I mean, right now as a project manager is we are building these transmission lines throughout the country. 
Now the biggest problem, challenge that we have is getting the right of way for the transmission lines. And as you know, Professor, the, the terrain that we have in our country is all hilly areas. And we have no option but to take our transmission lines through private land as well as government land. Now, this has, this has become a very, very big challenge. And in fact, coincidentally, I was just reading an article in the newspaper where public came out in full protest and stopped some of our works in, in some part of our country. I was just thinking, in what way can I build a public-private partnership in building these transmission lines so that we will have a win-win situation of course, for the betterment of the country. Thank you. Uh, the first question is easy to answer. No, I don't think those are the three most important problems facing your country. I mentioned things like youth unemployment, hydropower, roads, uh, and so forth, that are even more important, rural development, uh, preserving your culture while you open up to the world. Those are the those are huge challenges. But I do think though improving public services is of interest to all of us at the city level, at the national level. And those examples of providing better information about results along with resources from the private sector with government providing the framework for doing better are exciting things to think about. Most of us would never have thought of that by ourselves. So seeing those examples are inspiring. I am very interested in the convening idea. I think if we had the enthusiasm to identify one or two or three issues, like the youth unemployment, if that's the biggest one in people's minds, we could imagine some sort of uh, progress that would be surprising. But now turning to your specific question, let me give you the concept of preventive collaboration. Preventive collaboration. And I won't name the town, but you may have heard of a town in the south of Bhutan where they had a master plan for the city, and then the environmental folks wanted an environmental corridor so the animals could move right along the border. And it vitiated about a third of the plan, which had been going on for years, because there had not been preventive collaboration between those two departments. They were both doing their own thing. Nobody thought when they're doing their thing, let's see, if I'm planning a city, what could this repercussion be? Let's go down a list, environmentalists, oh yeah, there are these environmental corridors we have. Maybe we should think about that before we do the master plan of the city. It seems obvious in retrospect. The power thing is another example. When there are power lines anywhere in the world, you know there are going to be, you know in advance there are going to be repercussions at the private level of all kinds of people that are concerned about rights of way and so forth. Perfectly natural all over the world that people will resist that. They will resist it less if they are consulted in advance, and they feel they are heard and understood in their language and may be compensated in ways that are not just monetary, but in other ways. So I think the idea of preventive collaboration is an interesting one. I'll give you, a, a, yesterday or day before yesterday, I had a wonderful three-hour meeting with your cabinet, and the ministers, we talked about a lot of these issues, and they gave a lot of examples of the need for preventive collaboration. One of the public-private one had to do with steel for the dams that are being built and the hydropower plants that are being built. Not dams, but hydropower. And the steel was all being imported from India. And they said, well, you know, Bhutan can't produce the right quality and the right price. And when the prime minister asked them, have you sat down and talked about this with each other? Have you got the stakeholders together and actually talked about it? The answer was no, no. We didn't do that kind of preventive collaboration. He insisted they did, and after one meeting, they had a solution. One meeting. So it's a matter of we get down and we sit down here and we don't think to look outside. I'm not saying you, but we, it's just a general human nature. And so if we do this, if you can get your people to think, how do we do preventive collaboration? So what could go on here? What things could I get and what things could I hurt if I try to this plan that's just looking at my own ministry? Good evening, uh, Professor. My name is Karma Gile. Uh, I'm a participant uh, here at Rex. 
Uh, from, the, from your presentation, uh, I saw there are three stakeholders, the government, uh, the NGOs, and the private business. And also, uh, I, I had the feeling that uh, through your ex uh, examples, that uh, the area for collaboration or the opportunities for collaboration were mainly in the delivery of, or the public good, uh, such as uh, delivery of public services, uh, health, education, rural development. Uh, I was wondering uh, what could uh, be uh, the incentives uh, for the private uh, to collaborate. What, uh, uh, is there any areas, opportunities for collaboration in the private uh, good? Yes. Thank you. In, in all the collaborations I mentioned, the private sector makes more money. So, for example, in the Bangalore example, the private sector got better public services, so they were able to make more money, better roads, better power, better water, so they could run their factories more efficiently. So it wasn't, it's not charity again. It's an idea that there is a win-win, I hate that cliche, the win-win-win situation is what we're looking for here. Here's a lesson from economics. Sustainable reforms must be incentive compatible. Incentive compatible means they have to satisfy each of the people that's supposed to participate in their own definition of good things. We hope that the public good is served as well, but we need to make sure the private sector makes money as they go. The book, The Solution Revolution, which you look it up online, you'll see wonderful examples in areas like waste removal, where through the public-private collaboration, different kinds of technologies and different kinds of uh, businesses could be involved and actually make money cleaning up waste, a public good, but they're actually making money doing it. So um, in, in our world of public policy, we tend to think of the private sector, well, all they care about is money, but we should be thinking about it, how can we align their need to make money? That's what they do. Their need to provide better private services, how can we align that with the kind of public services we need so that we are all better off? It looks like we've reached the end of the comments. Che Wong, would you like to add a few comments of yours? Or questions? Uh, before I do that, uh, anybody from the audience? The threat of having Che Wong speak brought other people to the microphone. Good evening, Professor. Thank you very much for your... Could you please speak right into the mic? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. There. Good evening. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm a, I am Ishe. I work in the Ministry of Labor and Human Resources. I'm a passerby, actually. Uh, came here for a meeting and grabbed this opportunity to attend your lecture. Um, my question is, first is actually just a comment, not exactly a comment also. When you said looking up and out, um, is it and not looking down, do you think it's um, first you should look inside? I mean, we are Buddhist and what we say is, we call ourselves Nangpa, which means looking inside. Do you think it's um, preferably first look inside, not actually looking down, but looking inside, and then maybe look outside mm -hmm. and out? That is one uh, observation. And then the other thing is um, youth unemployment is a great issue. Uh, I work for the Ministry of Labor and Human Resources. The youth unemployment uh, rate is 9.6 as of the Labor Force Survey 2013. Um, so do you, can you share with us any, any uh, you know, um, successful collaborative convenience that uh, has happened worldwide uh, to, uh, that worked for youth unemployment? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start with your second question first. Thank you for both comments. I have not studied youth unemployment, so I don't have any good examples. But if I were Bhutan, and I have these foreign friends around here in international organizations, and this is a big problem, I'm going to go to them and say, listen, World Bank, you call yourselves the Knowledge Bank. What are three examples of countries that have made a difference on youth unemployment? What are they? And can you bring those examples to us? And the answer might be yes. So they know a lot of stuff, and we want to invite them to bring examples of things that work somewhere else. We can't always copy it, because Peru is not the same as Bhutan. 
As to your first question about looking inside, do you know the difference between self-consciousness and consciousness? When a person is self-conscious, they're always worried about how they appear to others, right? Oh my goodness, do I have the right clothes on? Do, is my hair correct? Am I wearing the right shoes? Am I saying things the right way? What will people think of me? And that can paralyze people. Self-consciousness is the enemy of consciousness. It's when we put that self-conscious aspect to the side and look inside more deeply in the way I'm sure you meant and think about what is it we're really trying to do here? Who are we really trying to be here? How can I lead myself more effectively in the words of His Highness? Right? Those are profound questions. And they're different from looking down. What I meant by looking down is looking down at your book that you're working on or looking down at the survey you're designing or looking down at the service you're providing very narrowly that day. We have to do that too. I'm not saying we should look around all the time and count the stars. We can't do that either. But we have to make some time with the discipline of awareness and the discipline of meditation. Not to self-consciousness, but consciousness as part of our diet of looking down, looking in, and looking out. Is anyone going to save Che Wang? Thank you. Good. I hope it's an easy question. It must be a hard one. That's why the microphone isn't working. If you just walk over here to this mic, you get it. This mic seems to be a problem one. No. So there's a microphone over here that's working. Just walk to the middle. There you go. Now, if it were I, I would have kicked over the camera as I walked uh, by. Firstly, thank you for your very interesting presentation with lots of relevance and insights uh, to Bhutan. Uh, I'm Jambe, a participant of Self3. Uh, in, uh, actually, I was struck by one of the known buzzword in your presentation where you mentioned about social entrepreneur. So I was wondering you know, whether they are totally different uh, breed of individuals or uh, what motivates them to become a social entrepreneur? Because we know, especially in this part of the world, we, we know that companies and entrepreneurs, they are driven by profit motive, basically, yes. among many other uh, motives. That's the main motive. Yeah. But uh, I would like to hear or, you know, something from Professor. Oh, what motivates someone to become a social entrepreneur? And also, like, you know, are there room for partnership and collaboration to promote social entrepreneurs, right. especially in a place like Bhutan? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, it's a good question. It turns out there are some studies of social entrepreneurs and what their personality types are and who they are. They're often extremely idealistic people who have a cause they believe in above their own uh, material satisfaction. Um, th they're also um, passionate about other people besides themselves. So they're worried about poor people or they're worried about the environment or they're worried about particular cultural uh, manifestations such as dance or fabric or whatever it might be. So they're deeply passionate and committed people. The old model of a social entrepreneur was somebody would start an NGO and would be an advocate, would get out and give beautiful speeches about how fabrics are neglected or how trees are not given enough space. You know, in Washington State, by the way, they have a lot of forests up there. And they say everybody on both sides of the timber industry, environmentalist uh, divide, love trees. Some of them like to see the trees like this, and some like to see the trees like this, is the difference between the two. They, but they both love trees. But their advocate mentality is not the same as what I'm talking about as social entrepreneur. The social entrepreneur I'm talking about is not just the person um, who sets up the NGO, who advocates for a cause. It's the person who actually engages in making a solution happen, often by creating a market where there was no market before, often by enlisting people that were her enemy before, like the government bureaucrats or those terrible private sector people, finding ways to create shared value in a situation is what these new civic entrepreneurs are doing. 
And so the combination of the heart and the head or the passion and the discipline are crucial for putting those two things together. So I hope you become a social entrepreneur.